The Great Controversy, Chapter 38, The Final Warning. I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon, as made by the second angel of Revelation 14, is to be repeated, with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. A terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker, their hearts more stubborn, until they are entrenched in an infantile hardihood. In defiance of the warnings which God has given, they will continue to trample upon one of the precepts of the Decalogue until they are led to persecute those who hold it sacred. Christ is set at naught in the contempt placed upon his word and his people. As the teachings of spiritualism are accepted by the churches, the restraint imposed upon the carnal heart is removed, and the profession of religion will become a cloak to conceal the basest iniquity. A belief in spiritual manifestations opens the door to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and thus the influence of evil angels will be felt in the churches. Of Babylon at the time brought to view in this prophecy, it is declared, Her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. She has filled up the measure of her guilt, and destruction is about to fall upon her. But God still has a people in Babylon, and before the visitation of his judgments, these faithful ones must be called out, that they partake not of her sins, and receive not of her plagues. Hence the movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory, and crying mightily with a strong voice, announcing the sins of Babylon. In connection with his message, the call is heard, Come out of her, my people. These announcements, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth, uniting to war against the commandments of God, will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by the observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance will be visited with civil penalties and it will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. With the issue thus clearly brought before him, Whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. But not one is made to suffer the wrath of God until the truth has been brought home to his mind and conscience and has been rejected. There are many who have never had an opportunity to hear the special truths for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. He who reads every heart 
and tries every motive, will leave none who desire a knowledge of the truth to be deceived as to the issues of the controversy. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light to make his decision intelligently. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath, in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God. The keeping of the true Sabbath, in obedience to God's law, is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Heretofore, those who presented the truths of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. But as the question of enforcing Sunday observance is widely agitated, the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, and the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. In every generation, God has sent his servants to rebuke sin, both in the world and in the church. But the people desire smooth things spoken to them, and the pure, unvarnished truth is not acceptable. Many reformers, in entering upon their work, determined to exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. They hoped by the example of a pure Christian life to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But the Spirit of God came upon them as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people. They could not refrain from preaching the plain utterances of the Bible, doctrines which they had been reluctant to present. They were impelled to zealously declare the truth and the danger which threatened souls. The words which the Lord gave them they uttered fearless of consequences, and the people were compelled to hear the warning. Thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed. As the time comes for it to be given with greater power, the Lord will work through humble instruments, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred, Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like these. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. As the people go to their former teachers with the eager inquiry, Are these things so? The ministers present fables, prophesy smooth things to soothe their fears and quiet the awakened conscience. But since many refuse to be satisfied with the mere authority of men and demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, the popular ministry, like the Pharisees of old, 
filled with anger as their authority is questioned, will denounce the message as of Satan and stir up the sin-loving multitudes to revile and persecute those who proclaim it. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The Church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, Papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. They will be threatened with fines and imprisonment, and some will be offered positions of influence, and others rewards and advantages as inducements to renounce their faith. But their steadfast answer is, show us from the word of God our error. The same plea that was made by Luther under similar circumstances. Those who are arranged before the courts make a strong vindication of the truth and some who hear them are led to take their stand to keep all the commandments of God. Thus light will be brought before thousands who otherwise would know nothing of these truths. Conscientious obedience to the word of God will be treated as rebellion. Blinded by Satan, the parent will exercise harshness and severity toward the believing child. The master or mistress will oppress the commandment-keeping servant. Affection will be alienated. Children will be disinherited and driven from home. The words of Paul will be literally fulfilled. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. As the defenders of truth refuse to honor the Sunday Sabbath, some of them will be thrust into prison. Some will be exiled. Some will be treated as slaves. To human wisdom, all this now seems impossible. But as the restraining spirit of God shall be withdrawn from men, and they shall be under the control of Satan, who hates the divine precepts, there will be strange developments. The heart can be very cruel when God's fear and love are removed. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. In this time of persecution, the faith of the Lord's servants will be tried. They have faithfully given the warning, looking to God and to his word alone. God's Spirit moving upon their hearts has constrained them to speak, stimulated with holy zeal and with the divine impulse strong upon them. They entered upon the performance of their duties without coldly calculating the consequences of speaking to the people of the word which the Lord had given them. They have not consulted their temporal interests, nor sought to preserve their reputation or their lives. Yet. When the storm of opposition and reproach bursts upon them, some, overwhelmed with consternation, will be ready to exclaim, Had we foreseen the consequences of our words, we would have held our peace. They are hedged in with difficulties. Satan assails them with fierce temptations. The work which they have undertaken seems far beyond their ability to accomplish. They are threatened with destruction. 
The enthusiasm which animated them is gone, yet they cannot turn back. Then, feeling their utter helplessness, they flee to the Mighty One for strength. They remember that the words which they have spoken were not theirs, but his who bade them give the warning. God put the truth into their hearts, and they could not forbear to proclaim it. The same trials have been experienced by men of God in ages past. Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Tyndale, Baxter, Wesley urged that the doctrines be brought to the test of the Bible and declared that they would renounce everything which it condemned. Against these men, persecution raged with relentless fury. Yet, they ceased not to declare the truth. Different periods in the history of the Church have each been marked by the development of some special truth adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. The Lord gives a special truth for the people in an emergency. Who dare refuse to publish it? He commands his servants to present the last invitation of mercy to the world. They cannot remain silent except at the peril of their souls. Christ's ambassadors have nothing to do with consequences. They must perform their duty and leave the results with God. As the opposition rises to a fiercer height, the servants of God are again perplexed, for it seems to them that they have brought the crisis. But conscience and the word of God assure them that their course is right, and although the trials continue, they are strengthened to bear them. The contest grows closer and sharper, but their faith and courage rise with the emergency. Their testimony is, we dare not tamper with God's word, dividing the holy law, calling one portion essential and another non-essential, to gain the favor of the world. The Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us. Christ has conquered the powers of earth, and shall we be afraid of a world already conquered? Persecution in its varied forms is the development of a principle which will exist as long as Satan exists and Christianity has vital power. No man can serve God without enlisting against himself the opposition of the hosts of darkness. Evil angels will assail him, alarmed that his influence is taking the prey from their hands. Evil men, rebuked by his example, will unite with them in seeking to separate him from God by alluring temptations. When these do not succeed, then a compelling power is employed to force the conscience. But so long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the law of the land. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it now is. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God has his agents among the leading men of the nation. The enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God. But statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments. Thus, a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third angel's message may do its work. When the final warning shall be given, it will arrest the attention of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working, and some of them will accept it and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory, a work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840-44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world 
And in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. As the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter end former rain unto the earth. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. Servants of God, with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not so much by argument, but by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence, yet many whose minds were impressed to have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now, the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness, and the honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations, are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side.